It's going to be the last talk of the day in this room. Um, Max will be talking about why developer platforms and a dedicated platform engineering team is a must-have. Thanks, Max. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, my name is Max Kerbecher. I'm founder of Liquid Reply. Uh, we do all the cool stuff around cloud native and Kubernetes. It means we try to make someone's life a little bit more easier. Um, but in the night, I'm working most of the time on some kind of open source projects, whatever it is, or I'm organizing KCDs like in Munich or Ukraine and do some other stuff. So uh, quite busy in the, in the space around Kubernetes and cloud native. First thing first, who of you would see himself as a platform engineer? Well, at least a good amount. And who of you has a platform engineering team in his company? Well, some more. Nearly the same amount. Well, this is quite interesting, and it's a quite inter interesting trend because we see that over the last year, it's almost have tripled to sometimes like multiplied by five to six times, depending on some countries, the amount of platform engineering teams where they are grown. All right. And I think here the platform engineer got lost a little bit. <laughs> uh, just to let you know, uh, our screen is a little bit um, 90s uh, out of signal style. Well, maybe, ah, perfect, nice. So this is not a problem or this is not an issue. And I do not want to show you now my uh, holiday vacation pictures uh, because I just take this last Saturday uh, here on the beach in, in Amsterdam. Um, and why I show you this is actually quite a nice little anecdote, which I found out was like maybe fitting to the situation. So my wife and me were running around there. It was a little bit windy. The sand feels more like it's brushing away everything else what I have on my face. And so we find a nice little bar, um, sit down where we wanted to sit down. When we entered, the waitress asked us to stay while the sign, which was on the entrance, told us to, to just take whatever seat we want to take. The next waitress, which immediately like Five seconds later, come to us, was like, guys, you can just take any seat which you want. So we go, we seat, found the table. As usual here, um, you have like often these QR codes on the table. So you scan it, you can start your order. What do you want to drink? What do you want to eat? So me as a nerd, I'm like, hey, cool, awesome. I would like to have this one. Oh, a salmon sandwich. Oh, it's gone. Ah, oh, sad. I need to go for something else. And then the waitress come and ask me, like, hey, what do you would like to order? I was like, okay, wait, i uh, confused. Well, I have started my order, but you're asking me, so I start reading what I have already typed in and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, in the end, we actually got what we want. Why is this so relevant? Well, for me, this is actually representing a little bit something of platform engineering and what we see as a DevOps. The waiter is just also continuously solving problems which are coming in. Whether it's someone who needs to find a seat, take an order, I don't know, maybe someone dropped down his class and break it, so we need to tidy it up. While on the other hand side, someone beforehand made a thought like, okay, you can sit everywhere where you want, you can order through the app, you can pay through the app, and the only thing which needs to be processed and triggered in the back end is like to deliver me the drinks, to deliver me the food. It's not the perfect example, but it's a good introduction, and it pops me up like, hey, this is something where I can at least think about like what is maybe a little bit the difference of these topics. So is DevOps dead? Well, uh, also I pretty much like this image. I would say no. It's an evolution. We see all kinds of roles out there. We see that we uh, were once, once in a time all like sysadmins running around, plugging our USB stick, upload all the kind of stuff. We need hours, days to bring a system. Um, then at some point in time, we come up with cross-functional teams, which then got to DevOps, and then we had some SRE and so on and so forth. The interesting thing is that all of these roles are came and they will stay. They will not just go away. And there's actually not the question like, are you DevOps, are you a platform engineer? No, this has two different focus. The only thing which happens in this space, and that's why I give today a talk about platform engineering is, from a platform engineering perspective, we need to protect a little bit this terminology and do not start throwing in everything what we can find. So when we look at large enterprises, which are also for us like the main customers, they have a totally different modus operandi than any other company which you found there, which is digital native. When you run and your only business is IT, you see the world fully different 
than when you're a large engineering company, when you're a large chemistry company, manufacturer, and so on and so forth. For sure, you do your digital transformation, but you see IT, and it doesn't matter what you're going to do, you see IT always in a very specific, different light than a Spotify, than a Netflix, or whoever else. And what is this a specific light? Well, large companies are oriented in projects. I gave you money, I gave you time, and you deliver me something. This is the whole business. If you find teams who are implemented in these large enterprises, then they often are just solving some kind of support function. They're not anymore in this driven, hey, I need to continuously move on something, I need to develop something, I, whatsoever. So the reality which we see is that DevOps, for example, is in the most companies written with a very small dev and a very big ops, asking us, hey, do you can make 24-7 operations for us? on the weekend, on the business, out of business hours? I mean, it's like, no, this is actually not what we want to focus. I want to build something cool. I want to make a new feature. I have planning a new feature release and so on and so forth. So this is a very, very brilliant chart by, by Daniel Prind or um, the Humanitech people who have actually put this into their um, platform engineering report. And what you can see in the horizontal lines are like different little domains about like the development tools you get in touch typically, um, what is your um, deployment and delivery responsibility, um, and all kinds of different things. And you see a little bit the cycles over the year. So most of us were around 2010, 2015, very happy if we had our first CI CD pipelines running. Nevertheless, they were super ugly and had hundreds of shell scripts, but somehow they did what they should do. But what is the most important thing in this chart is this yeah, magenta kind of area, which is a cognitive load which is pushed to, which is pressurizing actually the developer. You're not just can focus on just purely develop clean code, bring the next functionality. You have to take care about like, like some guys like us come around the corner, hey, how much resources does your application now need? Where do you want it to deploy it? What is the network configuration? You need to know and you want to know a lot of bunch of things around it. And the tools are getting actually more and more. Now, it's not necessarily the problem of having more tools, but it's about the responsibility which comes with the tools and which is pushed towards the role of a developer. And we're not yet touching fields like I need somewhere a service catalog, I need somewhere documentation and things like that, which by itself requires often their own team to also keep maintaining this. So what does the platform engineering actually do? Well, there's a very, very old statement, barely to read, but it's from 2017 from ThoughtWorks, which described already the first ideas of this platform engineering. And they say like these teams operate an internal platform which enables the delivery teams to self-service deploy and operate systems which reduce lead time and stack complexity. This idea is very old, it's nothing new. And maybe you could also put already this phrase into like the role definition of a DevOps, for example. But the very, very interesting part is self-service deploy and operate systems with reduced lead time. So it's not about to operate the whole stack with the application, but purely the underlying layer which is then called a platform. Sometimes this terminology is a little bit disturbing. It feels like, okay, everything is a platform. I'm going to a cloud platform. I want to have a platform as a service. There's everywhere a platform. So it's difficult to talk about what it's actually mean. But when we try to break it more down to the key aspects, we think about the different approaches which are out there. It boils down for three, I would say, more or less kind of major major components. There's for sure like 20 other things, but to list them all up, it would get kind of boring, and I will later tell you also that there's a white paper which you can read about platform engineering, which is even better, because then you have all the details. Um, nevertheless, um, the key aspects are about designing and building a tool chain, and a tool chain also includes to establish workflows, to have the missing, and to glue the different parts together. For us, there's, for example, always very relevant, we measure the majority of a workflow and the majority of this tool jail on how less shell scripts do we need. The less shell scripts, the better it is. The more shell scripts you have, the worse. And obviously, 
enable the self-service capabilities, which is sometimes very hard because you often need in your systems very um, immersive admin rights to grant them access to a cloud platform and start deploying everything. And especially when you want to give the right tooling to a team to maintain their own application, but you do not want to give so much of the access that they can most likely break something. So it's a very fine balanced area where we need to walk around. And why we all want to do this is to provide an integrated product that covers all operational needs and for, serves for the entire life cycle of an application. You actually, by the way, can read this also in just like one single line by line because then it still makes sense what's written there in it. And this all needs to play together with our cloud native world. So it's not like we use the technology from like 10 years ago, but we need to do way more than that. So we need to think about our design for automation, which maybe comes together with also the whole workflow and tool chain part of um, building a platform. We need to build for scalability and reliability. We need to handle the state. Um, I like this phrase, we need to handle state with smartness and care. I often have a discussion when we build platforms like, oh, we make everything stateless. And it's like, cool. But somewhere you will always have data. Where does it live? In the air? Do you download it and you zip it and then whatever do with it? Is it living in your email system? Where, where is the data living? So building platforms, you still need to take care about the data. But you need to be smart about it. And that can be sometimes a challenge. And obviously, everything must be, in the one or other way, self-contained. Now, this is actually the picture, and you most likely have seen it because it goes in our little cloud-native world that nearly got viral, I would say. Um, is it from the uh, tech for app delivery, um, which has written a nice white paper on platform engineering or what is a platform. And they come with a bunch of definitions, giving some, I would not say tool recommendations, but a selection of it. Like, this is a good starting point. They give you a good overview at all. And what I very much like on this picture is actually the, the foundation, where it's written um, capability and service providers. Because we're not discussing about the cloud provider, for example, itself. Many major enterprises have so huge internal private cloud systems, they can give you all of the things which you want to have. Database, no problem here. Block storage, fine. Mm, Software-defined network, which is separated from the rest of the net, absolutely no problem. Companies can do this. And this is very specific to think about, okay, capabilities I can get everywhere, but I want to abstract it away. And this is then the task for the platform itself. In the other way, uh, I also like to make a joke about it to say, like, this is the actually reduced picture of the CNCF landscape of all the tools out there and just, like, get, get rid of uh, 400 other projects. So when we take a look back on the, on the roles, now we maybe can understand when someone is talking about DevOps that this is a certain team, a team of specialists helping you in a specific area. Not everything, but a very specific area. Sometimes in enterprises, 24-7 support whatsoever. SREs have an application or product focus to increase the reliability of it. And then comes in the platform engineers. The platform engineers take here a very interesting role because, and that's why we can think back to the beginning, is DevOps dead? No. It just all plays well together. You can have a DevOps team which use the platform teams introduced tool chain and platform, and you can still run SIEs. Who is better or your best friend who knows about automation and how to increase reliability than the people and the folks who are working on the applications and who are in some way then also your end customer for it? So Dev DevOps is definitely not that but platform engineers is a nice support for the whole organization to help them to get rid of all this complexity. In short, we try to offload all the developers from the grown complexity in the past years, from all those hundreds of tools and responsibilities and whatsoever they need to take and reduce it to a very limited amount. This picture is maybe not 100% um, fitting to the, to the sentence itself, but I think this is very much representing how 
in the most companies you see actually in the IT landscape. It's a very messy thing. Everywhere is throwing with some phrases around. Here are some containers. There's data, data lake, whatsoever. Um, actually, we would need to attend it. We have now data meshes, which is spinning around the whole world, and so on and so forth. And as a platform engineering team, we try to make this as simple as possible so that we do not need to get uh, with this whole complexity somehow. So um, some of the benefits of platform teams. I would like to maybe hear some of you. What would be your things you immediately pop up with like, hey, this is one benefit would my team bring? Anyone has an idea? Please. Reusability. Reusability, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're speeding up things, right? More teams come, no problem. Here's your cluster. Feel good to go. Yeah. Any other? Security. Security yeah, absolutely. Who likes to do security on Kubernetes? It's fun. It's the best thing ever. You just throw stuff on top of it, and on the other side, like logs popping up, metrics, everything is escalating. Where you're like, it's secure now. What do you want? Right. So. Um, there's a bunch of, of nice benefits out there. Um, and it's very hard to read. I'm sorry for that. But on the left-hand side, there's written um, improved application lifecycle. This is something where we see a very, very broad field. Sometimes it's just get a little bit better. Not that much. We have one use case where we reduce the lifecycle of the application deployment from 90 days to less than five days. Just because we have to, just we screwed a little bit on the CI CD pipeline, we dropped off some operators which were not needed anymore, improved a little bit also the scalability about the platform, and all the magic was done. And we needed less than two months for it. So, even from a business perspective, the so called return on investment is like legit on it. There's also a very other interesting point in it. Um, I've recently discussed with the guys from Gitpod about it, um, which did a research on how much time does developers spend debugging actually their development experience, either on the local machine or somewhere else. And the quite interesting fact is that most developers spend at least one hour per week just fixing their development environments. Up to 30% need more than four to six hours and there's even a few percentage which needs sometimes 10 hours per week for fixing their environments. And then we are not talking about the deployment and the speed and so on and so forth. So we looked at one of our uh, clients who have a fully integrated development environment running in the cloud system. Everything is chained up. Everything is running automatically. There's practically nowhere, anywhere a reason that something fails except somewhere a network is down. And then it's totally out of our hands. This is maybe also the uh, right button thing. The only time where we experienced that we could not deliver any more any fluent delivery process and experience to one of our customers, which are developers, is when, from in this case, Azure, uh, there was a regional network problem and we could not reach our services. And last but not least, um, at least for, for us, which is also a relevant point, we're looking onto cost optimization. So not only building security by default into it, but we also immediately think about how do we can re give the platform the capability to reduce in the night times, on the weekends, for example, its scale. For developer platforms, this is actually quite easy because most of the time, the development team is not going to work in the middle of the night, except something really, really horrible happened and then I can spin it up. But typically, I don't need this stuff. I can just scale it down. And we, from... We, we, we carry it immediately or in the beginning from every project, we bring it from the beginning to reduce the scale of the platform where possible. So our lessons learned from um, enabling platform engineering. The first one is don't build everything by yourself. This is actually quite funny because we work so often together with, again, large enterprises and they face very early maybe a problem, start building their own solution for it. And at the point where the platform goes in production, where the platform goes live, there's already an open source, on, open source tool on the market which can solve also this problem. But 
somehow there's this need always to show like, hey, I can do this. I'm able to solve this problem by myself. I don't wait until someone else has solved this too. It's fine. But then if this comes, be ready to just exchange it. We recently migrated from uh, one Kubernetes platform to another Kubernetes platform and found out that there's like three or four self-written controllers we're running. We could all replace them. We add some KIDA to it. We had another scheduling mechanism to it, and problem were solved. Um, because this behavior also can drive to, I do not look around anymore. I don't keep myself informed what else is going on on the market when I just focus again on my little tiny world where I need to solve the problems. I talk about this project stuff already earlier, but platform teams are not a project. It's a team. It's a continuously being there facility in a company and have maybe one, maybe multiple targets, but they're an institution. They're not going to change. They should not have any budget cuts in the end of the year. They should not have any hard timelines for deliver or something. For sure, timelines are sometimes good, especially when something needs very, very long, but you should never treat a team, a platform team especially, as a project. Because what we see is that typically after one year, two year, a whole team just get a budget cut, everyone gets distributed somewhere in the company, and then they try to find somewhere else who can keep this thing alive. This doesn't make sense, especially because we are talking all about that uh, we need to run several hundreds of updates per year. And then we need to replace tools because they're getting better, they're getting improved, they're getting new approaches into it. The third lessons learned, which... Um, it's always very difficult to formulate in some way, but I try to, is this that we need a commitment from the team towards the whole vision and mission of like what is expected to be built. So that on the return on this, you can give the freedom and trust like, okay, you're going to catch whatever is going on. What does it mean is, and this should be not like disrespectful, but what we see sometimes is like that people are staffed into teams which absolutely do not want to work there. And when you miss this co commitment, for sure they maybe will not drive it. They maybe will implement what you ask them, but they will not drive it. And this is a very, very big difference. If you find drivers in your team, you can give them all the freedom. Here's your budget for trainings. Here's your budget for playing around with other tools. Here's your budget to go to Amsterdam, enjoy a little bit of time and do all the good things and exchange, get new ideas. In recent times, we see that also here, we see a lot of uh, cut downs of budgets in this way. And last but not least, things are changing, especially in our world. Who have implemented something for months was super proud of it. And then in the end, after three, four, five more weeks, you have to just delete it and drop in with something else. That's happened so often. Uh, I think I, I forgot already how often we, we have to do this. Um, this fear of like, oh, we need to throw away something. This is so painful. This is actually quite funny because this is actually an economical perspective on like, hey, we have built something. We created value because we invested time and effort and whatsoever. Now we cannot throw it away. Why? We have created it. We don't throw it away. Yeah, right. But sometimes, maybe other companies have invested more time, more effort, more money, and bring you an open source solution for, which is better, replacing also your problems. Um, and then this is the actually second part of the quote from ThoughtWorks, which is super funny and interesting because it's like a prediction and, and look into the glass ball. Um, because I say at some point in time that um, if you do not take care and you add tasks and responsibilities and other things to your platform teams. In the end, you get nothing else than just yet another shadow DevOps team. And this is something where we really need to take care of. That's why we give a talk today about it, because we need to take care of that this is not like flushed away from too much other things, which we maybe should not take care of at all. So if you have a platform engineering team, you should grow one. And grow is the right word, because it's not something which you just like can put people in, that's it. Right? You're not going into the forest, dig a very big hole around the tree, take it out, bring it to your garden. No, you need to start with the small things. You need to grow it over time. You give it time, you give water to it. 
and love and whatsoever, and then maybe it will get what you need and what you have as a platform engineering team. So, short checklist if you want to get started. First one, very important, provide an environment outside of your organizational budget. This is a killer for every team itself. Have a clear vision, because otherwise the people do not know in which direction they need to run. They don't need to know the clear path, but it's just relevant to, go, to know where I have to go in the end. Give space to grow, for example, budget and time, or to go to KubeCon, um, and give, your project, uh, mentality, uh, give up your project mentality. Platform teams are not there for project, they're there for staying. Thank you. Thanks so much, Max. Uh, any questions? Yeah, running over time, but let's get one question in. Thank you. Um, an IT department that I worked in recently um, was challenged with some of the ways you were kind of justifying the investment, where the, you know, the IT department is often a cost center. So if you increase revenue, they don't see that benefit. They're still working on a fixed budget. Yep. Where do you get the money from to create a platform team in the first place? Where does that money eventually reduce total cost within the IT group? Mm -hmm. That's exactly where I had this one slide showing you like this four, the three numbers and this one like, hey, we do not have downtimes anymore. Right. If you if you really can enable a team to be faster in the deployment or faster in their daily doing, this is where you save money. It's very hard to track, right? Especially after time. So if you have a team which is running, which is going forward, which, where everything is happy and fine, you have problem to justify. Like, look, there's still benefits in it. The thing is, if you would cut down the platform, you would see how everything crashes. So this is always a very, very difficult and delicate area where you, there's help, help nothing else than go back to Excel and start filling out and like, look, this is how it's get better. And when you're aware of it, you can start tracking this from the early beginning. All right, and so where do, where do the costs come out though, right? Because a lot of that description is sort of soft money and not hard money. I can't go mm -hmm. say, hey, guess what? There's 10 people I don't need over there anymore mm -hmm. because I have this platform team and it's self-service. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you ever see it coming back in a way where people can justify that savings back to a very um, hard-nosed CIO who's looking for those savings in a budget number? <laughs> um, yeah, again, it is very difficult. So that's why we try to implement from the beginning the approach of like, hey, this is the best practice for reduce also the costs. Whenever something ends up on the platform which we have built, there are reasons, there are tools included from the beginning to reduce the overall costs when you're out run wherever your cloud environment is running. This helps sometimes because suddenly you can say always oh, like, hey, my platform is never whatever, whatever happens is 30% cheaper like when you don't do it. So you try to fill this hole, right? Again, it's always like a, a big discussion on like how you can really put this up together. And it's from organization to organization very much difficult, uh, different. If you have a large organization which, which have huge processes, a platform team has super hard times because then you have some stuff like, oh, I request a new cloud account. It takes like five weeks. Cool. Your process may work, but theoretically your process is broken. And then you cannot sell like, hey, with our team, it's way faster, except you found maybe a technical solution to do another way around it. And then you end up in this shadow area where you maybe do not want to get there. Thanks. Uh, if you have any further questions, please catch Max offline. Uh, let's all move on to the lightning talks. Thanks so much, Max. Thank you. Thank you.